Okay, we come to our eighth study in the book of Ezekiel, and we really have a lot of ground to cover. Three chapters and about 90 verses. And so, Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning in chapter 14, verse 1. Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him myself in keeping with his great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. And so these men, some of the elders of Israel, these were Israelite leaders in exile. And they come to Ezekiel asking about his prophecies. And they acted as if they really wanted to hear from God. But God saw their hearts and he knew that they were not sincere. And as a result, God will answer their inquiry, that's for sure. He'll do it with punishment. 6. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Repent, turn from your idols, and renounce all your detestable practices. God's message to these men was very simple. Stop doing the things that I hate, and start doing the things that are right. 7. When any Israelite or any alien living in Israel separates himself from me and sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked, wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet to inquire of me, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. And if the prophet, whoops, I jumped ahead, I will set my face against that man and make him an example and a byword. I will cut him off from my people. Then you will know that I am the Lord. No one can serve God and someone or something else. If God isn't number one, then whatever is, is an idol. Nine, and if the prophet is enticed to utter a prophecy, I, the Lord, have enticed that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. They will bear their guilt. The prophet will be as guilty as the one who consults him. Then the people of Israel will no longer stray from me, nor will they defile themselves any more with all their sins. They will be my people, and I will be their God, de declares the Sovereign Lord. So these preachers who preach lies, God says they are guilty, and they will be punished. But those who listen to their lies and follow them, will also be punished. They are also guilty. 12. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and send famine upon it and kill its men and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. And it was said by some that God would not judge Israel. He would not judge Israel because there were still a few righteous in the land, and God will not judge the nation because of them. Well, God says, I'll take care of the righteous, but I'm still punishing Israel. And so, he says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. 
or if I send wild beasts through that country, and they leave it childless, and it becomes desolate so that no one can pass through it because of the beast, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if these three men were in it, they could not save their own sons or daughters, they alone would be saved, but the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword against that country, and say, Let the sword pass through out the land, and I kill its men and their animals. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if these three men were in it, they could not save their own sons or daughters, they alone would be saved. Or if I send a plague into that land, and pour out my wrath upon it through bloodshed, killing its men and their animals. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. They would save only themselves by their righteousness. And so the prayers and the presence of, of godly people will not stop God from punishing the wicked. And that is what he says. That's how bad things have become. Intercessions will no longer work. There's no point in praying. Four, or verse 21. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beast and plague, to kill its men and their animals? Yet there will be some survivors, sons and daughters, who will be brought out of it, they will come to you, and when you see their conduct and their actions, you will be consoled regarding the disaster I have brought upon Jerusalem. Every disaster I have brought upon it. You will be consoled when you see their conduct and their actions, for you will know that I have done nothing in it without cause, declares the Sovereign Lord. The decent Israelite exiles we're about to be joined by some ungodly, impenitent Israelites. And when they see their wickedness, they will know that God was right to punish their nation. Chapter 15 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, how is the wood of a vine better than that of a branch of any of the trees of the forest? Is wood ever taken from it to make anything useful? Do they make pegs from it to hang things on? And the answer, of course, is no. A vine is only good for producing fruit. Its wood is worthless. An apple tree, or any other kind of tree for that matter, that doesn't produce fruit can still be used to build something. A fruitless vine is totally worthless. A fruitless vine is worthless. And the point is this, God's people are worthless if they are not holy. If they don't produce fruit, they're useless. Verse 4. And after it is thrown into the fire as fuel, and the fire burns both ends and chars the middle, is it then useful for anything? If it was not useful for anything when it was whole, how much less can it be use can it be can it be made into something useful? when the fire has burned it and charred it. And so God is saying the burning of this vine it certainly isn't going to help matters. The burning of the vine actually speaks of the judgment and the deportation of God's people which occurred in 586 BC. They were useless before they were judged. They certainly are going to be useless after they are ransacked and deported. Verse 6, Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, As I have given the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest as fuel for the fire, so will I treat the people living in Jerusalem. I will set my face against them. Although they have come out of the fire, the fire will yet consume them. And when I set my face against them, you will know that I am the Lord. I will make the land desolate, because they have, been, they have been unfaithful, declares the Sovereign Lord. And so the cities and the land of Israel, that is the vine without fruit, will become desolate. Judgment from Almighty God. 
Chapter 16 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices, and say this is what the Sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. From her small beginnings, Israel was despised like an unwanted child. It says in verse 6, Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, Live. And so from this we see that God formed and protected his people in their early stage, in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when they were nothing. God took care of them. In verse 7, I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You who were naked and bare. God caused the little nation to thrive and prosper. Verse 8, later I passed by. And when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. God made a covenant with young Israel at Mount Sinai. They became his people. It was sort of like a marriage covenant. Verse 9, I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fab fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour, honey, and olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. And so the nation Israel became a national testimony to the greatness of God. The Lord's presence in that nation is the thing that made her great is the thing that made her beautiful and thrive and become the greatest nation in the world in her time. 15. But you trusted in your beauty, and you used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your flavors, favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. You took some of your garments to make gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution, such things should not happen, nor should they ever occur. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself idols and engaged in prostitution with them. And you took your embroidered clothes to put on them, and you offered my oil and incense before them. Also the food I provided for you, the fine flour, olive oil, and honey, I gave you to eat. You offered as fragrant incense before them. That is what happened, declares the Sovereign Lord. So notice what God is saying here. Israel took all these nice gifts that God gave to his people, and they devoted all those things in one way or another to idols. 20. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you bore to me, and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. In all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your blood. Notice how God calls children 
his children. All children are God's children. All the children who are aborted are God's children. All the little children that are abused are God's children. People better take care of their children because they are his children. And the Israelites killed the children that God gave them and then burned them as offerings to their own pagan idols, their pagan gods. 23. Woe, woe to you, declares the Sovereign Lord. In addition to all your other wickedness, you built a mound for yourself and made a lofty shrine in every public square. At the head of every street you built your lofty shrines and degraded your beauty, offering your body with in increasing promiscuity to anyone who would pass by. You engaged in prostitution with the Egyptians. You, your lustful neighbors, and, and, and provoked me to anger with your increasing promiscuity. So I stretched out my hand against you and reduced your territory. I gave you over to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were shocked by your lewd conduct. Isn't that amazing? That the Israelites, God's people, became so depraved that, that they even shocked the pagan people around them with their sin. The pagans around them weren't even as bad as the Israelites. 28. You engaged in prostitution with the Assyrians too, because you were insatiable. And even after that, you still were not satisfied. Then you increased your promiscuity to include Babylonia, a land of merchants. But even with this, you were not satisfied. How weak-willed you are, declares the Sovereign Lord. When you do all these things, acting like a brazen prostitute, when you built your mounds at the head of every street and made your lofty shrines in every public square, you were unlike a prostitute because you scorned payment. You adulterous wife, you prefer strangers to your own husband. Every prostitute receives a fee, but you give gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from everywhere for your illicit favors. So in your prostitution, you are the opposite of others. No one runs after you for your favors. You are the very opposite, for you give payment and none is given to you. You know, a harlot gets paid for her sin. Well, Israel certainly was a harlot, but she was more depraved than, than a regular harlot because she paid others to sin with her. She paid the ungodly nations around her to keep her company and to do bad things with her. Now, it's one thing to get paid as a harlot for your harlotries. It's another thing to be a spiritual harlot and pay others to do it with you. 35. Therefore, you prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because you poured out your wealth and exposed your nakedness in your promiscuity with your lovers, and because of all your detestable idols, and because you gave them your children's blood, therefore I'm going to gather all your lovers with whom you found pleasure those you loved as well as those you hated, I will gather them against you from all around and will strip you in front of them and they will see all your nakedness. I will sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery and who shed blood. I will bring upon you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous anger. Then I will hand you over to your lovers and they will tear down your mounds and destroy your lofty shrines. They will strip you of your clothes and take your fine jewelry and leave you naked and bare. They will bring a mob against you and you will stone, they will stone, excuse me, they will bring a mob against you who will stone you and hack you to pieces with their swords. Wow. God will punish his people and he will embarrass them publicly before their sinful friends, those that they committed sin with. We'll see that that their God is holy and doesn't put up with that kind of garbage. 41. They will burn down your houses and inflict punishment on you in the sight of many women. I will put a stop to your prostitution and you will no longer pay your lovers. Then my wrath against you will subside and my jealous anger will turn away from you. I will be calm and no longer angry. God will punish 
until his holy wrath is satisfied. Because you did not, verse 43 says, because you did not remember the days of your youth, but enraged me with all these things, I will surely bring down your head, I will bring down on your head what you have done, declares the Sovereign Lord. Did you not add lewdness to all your other detestable practices? Everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb about you. Like mother, like daughter. You are a true daughter of your mother, who despised her husband and her children. And you are a true sister of your sisters, who despised their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite, and your father an Amorite. And so... What God is saying is that Judah became like the pagans, which she came out of many years earlier. Verse 46, Your older sister was Samaria, who lived to the north of you with her daughters, and your younger sister, who lived to the south of you with her daughters, was Sodom. You not only walked in their ways and copied their detestable practices, but in all your ways, you soon became more depraved than they. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore I did away with them, as you have seen. Samaria did not commit half the sins you did. You have done more detestable things than they, and have made your sisters seem righteous by all these things you have done. Bear your disgrace, for you have furnished some justification for your sisters, because your sins were more vile than theirs. They appear more righteous than you. So then, be ashamed and bear your disgrace, for you have made your sisters appear righteous. However, I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, and of Samaria and her daughters, and your fortunes along with them, so that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all you have done in giving them comfort. And your sisters, Sodom with her daughters, and Samaria with her daughters, and will return to what they were before. And you and your daughters will return to what you were before. You would not even mention your sister Sodom in the day of your pride, before your wickedness was uncovered. Even so, you are now scorned by the daughters of Edom and all her neighbors and the daughters of the Philistines, all those around you who despise you. You will bear the consequences of your lewdness and your detestable practices, declares the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will deal with you as you deserve, because you have despised my oath by breaking the covenant. The northern kingdom of Israel, which was Samaria, and the city of Sodom, were bad enough to be destroyed by God, and one might think that nothing could be worse than they were. No one could top their sin, but God said Judah was worse. So if they were punished, Judah certainly can expect to be punished. It's on the way. In fact, it's already happening. Verse 60. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. In spite of their evil, God will not toss his, his people Israel aside for good. You know, Many of his people died and went to hell because of their sin, but God did not throw away the the plan that he had to have a people on earth, and that people today is the church, made up of Jews and Gentiles both. 61. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both those who are older than you and those who are younger. I will give them to you as daughters, but not, not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. Then, when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed, and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the Sovereign Lord. 
God Himself made atonement for sins in Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's what He means. That's what He's referring to when He says that He will make atonement for all that they have done, for all that all of us have done. In verse 63, He says that. And so God did that in Christ on the cross. The suffering and the death of Jesus, that is the one and only thing that make it possible for God to forgive those who repent and still be just about doing it. So he doesn't have to set aside his justice to forgive us because Jesus Christ was punished. He took the just punishment for our sins. Next time, chapter 17. Until then, so long, everyone.